Hey everybody, welcome to this other lecture on set theory. Today we are going to look at natural numbers where uh, um, so the topics will include infinity, the axiom of infinity, uh, the axioms of arithmetic, we're going to learn about induction and things like that. So let us get started. So you may remember having seen at the very beginning of the notes, like 200 page ago, uh, pages ago, a uh, quote by John von Neumann, who said, if people do not believe that mathematics is simple, it's only because they do not realize how complicated life is. Uh, I very much love that quote because I, I do think that life is very simple when you compare it to life. But on the other hand, um, there are some subtleties that are often swept under the rug. And I think what happens is that those accumulate to the point that um, at some point people might feel overwhelmed and they start telling themselves, oh, I suck at math, I must not be good at math and blah, blah, blah. So my view is that if we actually take a little bit of a pause to return to those very fundamental concepts to understand their sophistication, uh, then a lot of those complications that have accumulated along the way uh, kind of dissipate so that we really can can understand things with much more clarity. And, and this is really part of the motivation for doing what we're going to be doing today. So we're going to start by examining the most common uh, set theoretical answers to answer to questions such as that, such, such as the following, which are, are very basic. Uh, like, what are those natural numbers, uh, those numbers like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc.? Uh, what does it mean to say that a basket contains five apples or a book 168 pages or that a box of eggs contains 12, something like that? Uh, what are the operations that we can perform on natural numbers and what are the properties of, the, of these operations? And how the hell do we know any of that, right? So I think those are very deep philosophical questions that present genuine difficulties. And it's actually quite subtle to tackle them systematically. But we will tackle them systematically today. And, and of course, there are many different ways of doing that. If you read the literature and philosophy and foundations of mathematics, there are very, very different approaches that exist. Uh, but it being a course on set theory, we're going to look at a set theoretical approach, and we're going to look at the most widespread one, which is due to von Neumann, whom I quoted on the last slide. So we will start by distinguishing two different questions, uh, two different questions that are, of course, related to each other. Uh, the first one is, how many elements does a set have, right? So uh, does it have two? Does it have three? Does it have four, etc.? In order to be able to answer a question like that, you need to know what a number is. Right? But then there's another question, which is which doesn't really require you to know what a number is. The question is, do those two sets have the same number of elements? Right? So uh, for that, you don't need to know what the number two is or the number three is. You just need to be able to compare them with each other. So in a way, the answering that second question is more primitive conceptually than answering the first question, which is why we're going to start with it, with the second question. And then we're going to go to the first question after we answer that one. And, and that study, that, that answer that we're going to that we're going to give to question two and also the question one eventually, eventually builds on the study of functions that we have done last time. All right, so let's get started. So to say that two sets A and B have the same number of elements uh, is to say the same as to say that they are equinumerous. So equinumerous is just a fancy adjective to say has the same number of elements. 
And we say two sets have the same number of elements, which is denoted A, I don't know, twiggly equal sign B. <laughs> All right, so A is equinumerous with B. If and only if there is a function f from A to B, and that function is a bijection. Now, why, why is that a good definition of equinumerosity? Uh, well, it's a good definition because as we saw, bijections have that really special character according to which uh, they put elements of the domain and the codomain in one-to-one -one correspondence, right? So, so that if there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the elements of the domain and the codomain, that must mean that the two sets, the, co the domain and the codomain, have the same number of elements. So when two sets are equinumerous, we will also say there is a bijection from A to B, or there is a one-to-one -one correspondence from A to B. Now notice it's not to say that all functions from A to B are bijections, right? Uh, as we see, there's an existential quantifier. It says there must be at least one function from A to B that happens to be a bijection, right? So, so the clause there is that we find in that definition quantifies over a particular set, which is the set of all functions from A to B, which we saw is denoted B superscript A. So let's look at an example. Here we're gonna take three sets. Set A contains zero and one. Set B contains Cleopatra, and C contains elements A and B, okay? So now let's look at uh, 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 a function from A to C, right? We're, we're first gonna compare A to C. So here's one that sends zero to A, and that sends one to B. Now, as we see, this is a function because it satisfies totality and uniqueness. Uh, Moreover, it's injective because it sends different elements of the domain to different elements of the codomain. And furthermore, it's surjective because every element of the, of the codomain, C, is mapped on by at least one element of the domain. So the function F that I'm giving you here is a bijection, which shows that A and C are equinumerous sets. Makes sense, right? As we see, uh, they have the same number of elements. Now, what about A and B? Well, of course, they don't have the same number of elements. Now, the set of functions from A to B contains just one function that maps both 0 and 1 to Cleopatra. It's forced. There's no other choice because there are two elements in the domain and just one in the codomain. Right? So both have to be mapped to the same thing. Now, so that means this function is not injective, and so it's not bijective. Uh, and since that's the only function we have from A to B, that means that A is not equinumerous with B. So A is equinumerous with C, A is not equinumerous with B, that makes us think, well, B is not gonna be equinumerous with C. That would be a good guess. Now, if we look at all the functions from B to C, there's gonna be two different functions. Again, there's just one element in B, and that element, Cleopatra, can be mapped either on A or on B. That corresponds to two different functions, as we see here. So the set of functions from B to C has two functions, neither of which is surjective because in both cases, in the first case, nothing maps on B and in the second, nothing maps on A. Not surjective, therefore not bijective, therefore B is not equinumerous with C, All right? So here we use the few intuitions like, oh, A is equinumerous with C, uh, A is not equinumerous with B, it must follow that B is not equinumerous with C. That sort of relationships between judgments of equinumerosity can be um, organized with the following theorem. So equinumerosity turns out to be an equivalence relation, which means that every set is equinumerous with itself. Duh, right? It has to. 
Uh, moreover, if A is equinumerous with B, then it follows that B is equinumerous with A, again, da, right? Um, and, and if A is equinumerous with B, and furthermore, B is equinumerous with C, it follows that A is equinumerous with C, right? So since, since equinumerosity is an equivalence uh, relation, it follows that um, sets that are uh, in a certain collection of sets would be clusterized in groups by virtue of this equivalence relation. They would form what we called uh, equivalence classes. So, so you'd have all the sets with zero objects in one cluster, all the sets with one object in another cluster, all the sets with two objects in another cluster, etc. Right? So, so you see it makes sense, right? It's it's a good idea. So now, very simply, we have that theorem. But why is it true? It seems intuitively correct, but how do we prove it given how we have defined equinumerosity? And I find that theorem extremely cool uh, in, its, in terms of its proofs because it uses all the fun facts that we have learned about functions last time. Uh, so so let's, let's just get started. Reflexivity. Uh, is there a bijection from A to A? Hell, yeah, there is one. It's the identity relation on A, the, the so-called, what I call the do-nothing function, right? That takes an element of A and sends it back to itself. And since it's total, uh, uh, since it's a function, it's total, which means that it's also surjective and injective. So it's a bijection, right? So is there a bijection from A to A? Yes, the identity. And that in itself, shows that A is equinumerous with itself. Cool. So let's look at uh, symmetry. Now suppose there's a bijection from A to B. Uh, we suppose A is equinumerous with B, and then we try to show that as a result, B is equinumerous with A. Right? So if we assume A is equinumerous with B, that means that there is a bijection from A to B. But then we saw that if f is a bijection, then f has a unique inverse, which is denoted f superscript minus one. And we also saw that if f is a bijection, it has an inverse, which is f, f minus one, but that this inverse is also a bijection. Huh. So we have a bijection from b to a, which shows that b is equinumerous with a. Cool. Now, what about transitivity? Well, guess what? Uh, suppose that A is equinumerous with B and B is equinumerous with C. So that means there's a bijection from A to B, call it F. And then there's a bijection from B to C, call it G. But then the composite of two bijective, bijective functions is also bijective. So G after A is a bijection, which shows that A is equinumerous with C. Very nice, huh? So, so there are all sorts of permutations and things that you can that you can do with those concepts. One of the exercises that I give you in 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 the notes is, uh, hey, look into that. Suppose A is a subset of B and B is a subset of C. Uh, suppose also that there are functions from A to B and from B to C such that they are surjective. Uh, it will follow that as a result, A is equinumerous with C. In fact, it's equal to C, but <laughs> of course, if it's equal, it's equinumerous. And there are all sorts of combinations that you could look into uh, along those lines. So lots of cool questions. Uh, when you tackle questions like that, you might want to draw pictures with the three sets and objects and how they must relate to each other. And, and then you add in, in text alongside the dots, uh, the information that you have about the problem. So, so here, that's, that's a very poor drawing that I was doing with my cursor during the office hours on Monday. And people told me that it actually helps them quite a bit quite a bit to think about questions involving injective and surjective functions and things like that. 
So I really would uh, like to encourage you uh, to uh, to keep an eye on questions like that. Um, in fact, that question was to show that if the function from A to B is injective and the function from B to C is injective, um, no, sorry. If the composite of the function from B to C and the function from A to B is injective, then it follows that the restriction of the function from B to C to the range of that function here uh, must be injective as well. So that was an exercise from last week, but that sort of picture applies more generally to questions of that kind. So it's a very good way of, of thinking about, about them. But anyway, that's that's a side discussion. Um, what we've seen now is, well, uh, we, we have a way to tell when two sets are equinumerous, but nothing in what we've said tell us what numbers are. Right? So we can say if two sets with what we say two elements uh, um, uh, are equinumerous, but nothing tells us what it means for a set to have two elements. So we turn to that question now. And the approach that, that we're going to use, I like to, to explain it by uh, saying it's similar to, to what we could call the Paris titanium meter thick paradigm. And you might, you might be thinking, uh, what? <laughs> what is it you're talking about? Uh, well, um, so in the 19th century, uh, people were trying to, to explain more rigorously lengths. Uh, um, so there were all sorts of different units of measurement used in different cities and countries, and there was really no uniformity like we have today. So back in the days, um, uh, the French like were like, "Yeah, let, let's use the metric system." But then, of course, to do that, you you need to uh, talk about uh, well, what's a meter, right? <laughs> uh, so, so then you could enter all sorts of fancy discussions about what a meter is, but what they decided to do instead is they picked a metal that uh, isn't much susceptible to expansion and contractions when the heat changes and various other circumstances change. So that's why they chose titanium. Uh, and they just made one stick that was about yay big and they kept it in a special office and they said, what is a meter? It's that. That one particular thing is the meter, right? And then if you ask me, oh, is my table one meter long? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to put it right next to the the meter, that one stick, and we're going to see if it's the same length or if it's longer or, or shorter, right? So, so, so you arbitrarily or conventionally pick that one object, uh, which is going to be used as a benchmark for all your measurements from, from there on. So, of course, it's not a perfect way of thinking about legs. You know, if, if you talk with someone in, in this, who works in the theory of measurements today, they're going to say, yeah, that's a bit of a naive approach. Fine, yes, yes, it is a bit of a naive approach. But on the other hand, it's easy, right? So, so it is easy, and there is some level of elegance in that because it's such a simple solution to what uh, could be and, and probably is deep down a, a very difficult problem. But, but at least that paradigm is simple. Uh, it's not tough to understand. And we're going to try to do just the same with our natural numbers. So for each number, let's say 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, blah, 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 say for 3, we're going to pick one set with three elements, and we're going to say, that's our meter stick for 3, right? And all the sets that are equinumerous with that thing are going to be set with three elements. That's the idea. Uh, now, of course, we're going to want to pick a set with three elements that is guaranteed to exist based on the axioms of, of set theory, because we wouldn't want it to be a contingent affair that there is a number three or you know, something like that. So, so eventually, in order to define the numbers, that's exactly what we're going to do. 
we're going to pick one representative set, one Paris meter stick thing uh, as benchmark, and, and we're just going to use those as, by convention, as the definition of number, just like that stick was by definition the meter, right? Uh, so we're going to pick one set with zero element, one set with one element, one set with two, et cetera, et cetera. Easy breezy. Now for zero, there isn't much of a choice because as we saw, there exists only one set with zero elements and that's the empty set. So for our first representative set, the definition is dead easy. We say by definition, zero is the empty set. Just that. Okay, so that's very easy. So one down, infinitely many left to go. Let's keep going, right? But of course, we're not going to go case by case, one by one, because there are infinitely many natural numbers. So we'd like uh, to have a pattern from now on to define them all, right? For zero, only one choice. So what are we going to do? We're going to pick that one, of course. And then for the other one, we'd just like to have a pattern that is just going to apply to all of them. So let's, let's have a look at that. Now, I want to draw your attention to one intuition that we have. You know, we, we have some intuitive knowledge of arithmetic. I mean, it's not, it's not solidly founded in logic. It's mostly based on our experience of counting things from, from the time we're, I don't know, when do we learn numbers? Like four, three, five? Anyway, in that ballpark. Um, Right. So, so let me just, so, so here's the natural number sequence, and, and I just want you to observe the following. Look at the set of numbers that are smaller than one. Well, that's the set that contains zero. It has one members, one member. So the set of numbers less than one has one member. The set of numbers less than two has two members. The set of member numbers less than three has three members. Uh, here, of course, that should be a three, I presume. Then has four members. Okay, I switched the three and the four. You get the idea, right? <laughs> uh, that's a very simple idea. Now, that's the pattern that we want to use in order to define all the other natural numbers. Now, it's not perfect, as I've just presented it, uh, because... Uh, I've asked you to, to think about your intuitions and your knowledge that would be pre-existent about the sequence of natural numbers right? and, and also the order relation between the natural numbers. And those are all things that we would like to explain, you know, to give foundations for when we do foundations of arithmetic. So if we were to proceed that way, it would be a little bit circular. Nonetheless, that's the idea that we want to exploit in generating our pattern. So what we're going to do next is we're just going to take that idea and try to present it in a better way that isn't circular. That's going to mean we're going to present it in a slightly more abstract way, uh, but that still, still remains the basic idea of it. So here's the idea. So we said, by definition, zero is the empty set. And then what we're going to say is x plus, which we read the successor of x, is defined as x union singleton x. Okay? So, so x, suppose x is a number, that would be a set of numbers. Let's say, suppose x is the number four. Right? We associate the number four with the set containing zero, one, two, three. And then by taking the union, we're adding four to it. So that should give us the successor of four, which is five. Okay. Now, the way it's defined here, of course, it's just based on the notion of a union and the notion of a singleton set. Right? So uh, we know that this set exists and it is unique for any set X. It's guaranteed by the pairing and the union axiom. So that's good. We know it's a good definition that's validated by our axioms. Um, and again, it just captures the idea that, uh, of the pattern that we gave uh, last place. So, so here, one 
uh, is defined as the successor of zero, two is defined as the successor of one, three is defined as the successor of two, etc., etc. Okay, uh, we can obviously keep iterating that procedure for as long as we want uh, because it's always going to be well defined. Easy. Right? So, so we now we now have um, something that is close to a definition of numbers. Uh, uh, we don't fully have a definition of numbers. We have we have the number zero, cool. And then we have defined an operation, which we call the successor operation, but it doesn't apply, it doesn't apply just to numbers. It applies to sets in general. So now we want to focus a little bit to just look at numbers. In order to do that, we need a little bit of a, uh, uh, of a, a definition. But first I want to draw your attention on a few facts that you can see immediately uh, from the definition of the successor. Uh, we're going to use those many, many, many times in what follows. Okay, so uh, we notice that for any set X, X is in its successor because the successor is the union of X and singleton set. Of course, X is in singleton X, so it's in the union, right? So X is a member of its successor. Similarly, uh, since the successor of X is X union this, uh, every elements in X are in X, so they are all in the union. So uh, every uh, set X is a subset of its successor. Uh, similarly, uh, you could do the proof more rigorously if you want, but it's fairly easy to see. X is also in the successor of its successor. And this one is a little bit harder to see, I just put it there so that you have um, one that is uh, a little bit less trivial to think about, but it's fairly easy as well. So I encourage you to think about that one. Uh, but mostly the first two are going to be used many, many times uh, today in what follows. So please keep those in mind. Uh, now, the next question is, um, is there a set that contains zero, the successor of zero, the successor of the successor of zero, which would be two, and the successor of two, uh, which is three, and the successor of three, which is, so is there a set that contains zero and the infinite, infinitely many numbers uh, that we would get by applying that successor operation? A set that contains every single natural number and we know there's infinitely many of them right? it's not like there's a largest natural number and it stops there it just keeps going right that's how it works uh so so is there a set that contains all the natural numbers and and the answer is uh well We'll see. <laughs> uh, but first, I want to, to, to give a name to what a set that contains all natural numbers would, would be like. Right? So we say, uh, here's the definition of a successor set. Right? So it's a set that contains zero. And for all the x, el any element in the set, uh, uh, um, it also contains its successor. Right? So if, if a set is a successor set, uh, uh, then it will contain all the natural numbers. Now, um, it could contain other things as well, right? So nothing in the definition says contains just the natural numbers, but it has at least to contain all the natural numbers in order to be considered a successor set. Um, so, so the question I was asking here, is there a set that contains every single natural number? What I was really asking in, in terms of what was just defined here is, well, is there a successor set? Right? Are the axioms of set theory that we have introduced so far guaranteeing that there is at least one successor set, at least one set that contains all the natural numbers? And the answer is no. No, it's not. Uh, so, so the axioms that we have already guarantee that we have infinitely many sets. Uh, because you say so you could just keep applying the singleton operation infinitely many times, right? There's no 
maximum after which you can't apply the uh, singleton operation anymore. Uh, so there is infinitely many sets, um, but uh, nothing guarantees that any of those sets has infinitely many elements in it, right? Uh, so, so since nothing guarantees that, nothing guarantees that there's a successor set because a successor set by construction has infinitely many terms, okay? So, so we'll have to do something about that because in mathematics, in arithmetic, we wanna define all sorts of functions with domains that are natural numbers and codomain that are natural numbers. And the domains and codomains have to be set. So if, if, we, if we can't even say that there, there is a, a domain and codomain to those functions, well, we're in trouble. Right? That, that's, that's intolerable. At least it doesn't allow us to uh, uh, articulate foundations for the way mathematics is done. At a more philosophical level, of course, you might argue, yeah, well, the, the way the mathematics is normally done is just wrong, right? There's no such thing as infinity. And in fact, a lot of philosophers have defended views like that. So I'm not quite sure where they're coming from with that. Um, I think there's a lot of metaphysical confusion at work there, uh, but, but um, um, yeah. For the sake of that course, my prescription is, well, let's keep the metaphysics far away from us and, and just realize that, yeah, this idea of infinity is not so crazy. It just keeps, means you keep doing things on and on and on. And now what we want to say is just like those things you could do on and on and on, you can just put them all together and that forms a set. Okay, so, so the next axiom tells us precisely that there exists a successor set. That's called the axiom of infinity because it guarantees that there exists a set with infinitely many members, okay? So, so now, now that we have introduced this axiom, on top of all the other axioms that we had, uh, uh, we know that there exists a set that contains zero, that contains one, and two, and three, and four, and so forth, and so on contains all the natural numbers, but maybe some other junk as well, right? So as we did when we introduced other axioms, now, now we'd like to, to take that successor set and remove all the junk to just keep what we want, the natural numbers. Uh, and then, then we'll use as a definition, poof, that's the natural numbers. So, so that's what we're gonna do. First, I just wanna show uh, something that's important very quickly. Um, the, the proof uh, is in the notes. It's a very simple one. It just says that take a collection of successor sets, take a non-empty collection of successor sets. It's gonna turn out that uh, the set of objects, which is in all the successor sets, itself will be a successor set. So the intersection of a collection of successor sets itself is a successor set. Okay, so this is cool. Why? Because, um, well, the intersection of the collection is itself in the collection. So we can say that the intersection of the collection is the smallest set in the collection in the sense that it has the fewest elements. Uh, it has the less junk, right? So, so that's going to be very important because in a way, that's precisely what we want to do. We want to take a collection of successor sets and then remove all the extra elements to keep the smallest number of elements that we can uh, that uh, uh, makes it a successor set. So if that's the case, then it's going to contain zero and one and two and three and no junk on top of that. Okay, so that's what the definition here does. So let S be uh, a successor set that is guaranteed to exist uh, uh, by, the, um, um, by the axiom of infinity. And now, now since S is a set, it's a successor set, but since it's a set, we can look at all of its subsets. There's gonna be tons of subsets, 
right? Uh, clearly, one of those subsets is going to contain the natural numbers and nothing else, right? Uh, so we generate all those subsets of S and form a collection of it, right? So C is the collection of subsets of S or elements of the power set of S such that they are successive sets. So we form a collection of successive, of successive sets. Uh, and then we just take its intersection. So the intersection of that collection is going to be the smallest successive set that, that contains 0, 1, 2, 3, etc., but nothing else. So it's going to have infinitely many elements, but just the right ones. Okay? So, so that set here is what we call the set of natural numbers. And in set theory, that set is denoted uh, lowercase omega. So if some element, uh, if something is in the set omega, say n, then uh, it's called a natural number. So very often we're going to use the letter n and m for the uh, elements of the set omega because n and m are but fairly intuitive variables or constants to, to discuss natural numbers, okay? So, so very often in math, uh, the set of natural numbers is, is, is denoted with that uh, like blackboard letter type where, where we just say, oh, curly brace, zero, one, two, three, four, and then dot, dot, dot. I call those the dots of despair because People use those dots just because they don't have any better idea what to do, right? They just say, oh, and keep going like that. But suppose you're a person who doesn't know, what do you mean like that? What do you want me to do? Uh, uh, people would be hard pressed to, 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 say, uh, to say what to do. They might say, well, just keep adding one. And then you'd be like, uh, okay, adding one. So what's addition? Can you tell me what's addition? Uh, well, addition is a function from a natural number to another natural number. It's like, all right, so now you want me to use a function that presumes I know what the natural numbers are to specify its domain and codomain in order to figure out what the natural numbers are. Thank you very much. I love my circularities like the next person, but here we're trying to define things in a non-circular way. Right, so those dots of despairs are when there's no hope of listing all the elements because there's infinitely many. Uh, and, and people just don't know what to do better, so they write dot, dot, dot. Right? Uh, so, so, of course, now we're doing foundations. We're learning how to do rigorous proofs. So we don't want to use the dots of despair. Um, and set theorists, in general, use omega to, to stand in contrast with that, that you know, intuitive, loose, unrigorous notation that is used very often in mathematics. So, so when you use omega, it, it's the same set, right? It's just two different labels for it. But, but when you use omega, you're kind of saying, I know what I'm doing, right? So, uh, so set theorists, of course, love to make it clear that they know what they're doing, so. So that's what they're doing, <laughs> okay? So what do we see from that definition? As I said, is omega is the smallest successive set. It's the one with the fewest elements. And I know that fewest is not a, a word, but it, I can't think of a better one. It contains zero, the successor is zero, the successor, blah, 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 and so on and so forth. Right? And, and this idea of being the smallest successor set that is the absolutely essential thing to know about the structure of natural numbers. If you know that the natural numbers are the smallest successor set, you know everything there is to know about natural numbers. Well, at least you have the premise to prove everything else that you need to prove about natural numbers. Okay? Uh, so basically what we're going to do in the rest of today's lecture and in the next one is we're going to see precisely what is the juice that we can draw out from that definition. And it's going to turn out there's quite a bit of juice that we can drag from, from that. Drag? No, draw? Extract? Yeah. Quite a bit of juice that we can extract from this. So first, I can say 
hey, now, uh, uh, now that we have defined a natural number, we can define a function, which is the function, the successor function, which now doesn't apply to sets in general, but applies specifically to natural numbers. It takes a natural number and sends it to the next one, right? So, so the successor function is defined such that it sends the uh, number n to its successor, duh, obvious. But now we have a well-defined domain and codomain, so we're very proud of ourselves. Now, do you think that the successor function is surjective? I'll give you a second, think about it. Is it surjective? You might think yes, but what about zero? Is there an LM is zero the successor of any number? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so maybe it's not surjective after all. Is it injective? It feels like intuitively, it feels like it's a one-to-one -one correspondence, right? Uh, but it's intuitive, but it's a good intuition. As we will will show and will prove it, it is an injective function. Uh, but we're going to see that on, I think, slide number 32, and now we are on slide 20, which means we need quite a bit of work to do. We have quite a bit of work to do before we can actually prove that this function is injective. Um, so, so what do you say? Should we start that work? I suggest we do. So now what we have is a definition of equinomerosity. We have a definition for each individual natural number. Uh, we know that there is a set that contains all and only the natural numbers. Now, in most math books, um, uh, people would introduce five axioms of arithmetic, and sometimes they're just called the P-N-O axiom, right? It's P-N-O, P-E-A-N-O, not piano like ta da 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 right? Um, so it's a the P, P and O arithmetic, but it's a bit of a historical error. So this is why I call it the the Dedekind P and O arithmetic because it was really based on on both of their works. Who uh, 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 in the second half of the 19th century, so it's now like way back, 100, 150, 170 years ago. Now those two people, among others, uh, did a lot of work to clarify the foundations of arithmetic. It's fascinating stuff, uh, like a philosophical gold mine, really, if you ask me. Uh, but we're gonna look at a sort of simplified version of it, the sort of a basic textbook version of it, where they, there are those five axioms, right? But for us, they're not gonna be axioms. We're just gonna prove them from our axioms and definitions that we have introduced as part, uh, as part of our theory of sets, okay? So, so for us, they're not axioms, they're theorems. So the first two principles, the first two so-called axioms of a uh, Dedekind piano, the first says zero is a natural number. The, says, uh, the second says if n is a natural number, then the successor of n is a natural number. Right? So for us, the proof is like poof, immediate, because we defined omega as a successor set, right? So since omega is a successor set, that means it contains zero by the first clause of what it means to be a successor set. And by the second clause, if there's some natural number there, its successor is in there as well, right? So one and two are automatically satisfied by definition. Uh, now, of course, it's not an accident that we introduce those definitions. Right? That's because we need the natural numbers to be an inductive structure, uh, a successor set structure. Um, the, 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 third, the third principle is also fairly straightforward. It says zero is not the successor of any number, which answers the question I asked a little bit before about, uh, hey, is S a surjective function? No because zero is not mapped on by anything. It's not the successor of any number. Uh, symbolically, that just says for all n in omega, zero is not the successor of n. Uh, so if, if, there, if n was the successor of a number, uh, then, then you could write zero equals the successor of n, 
but we saw that n is in the successor of n so that means there would be something in zero but that's impossible because we define zero to be the empty set <laughs> so we get that free again who doesn't love free stuff we do get so much free stuff well we get more stuff but it's a bit less free because we need to work a little bit more to get the next thing okay so so pull your sleeve roll your sleeves and get ready for a little bit of work coming the fourth principle has a lot more juice and it's beautiful it's a very important principle and it's called the principle of mathematical induction I'm so happy that we're finally talking about induction because a course on proofs that doesn't talk about mathematical induction is it's a shame you know it's it's like um it's like a car without not without engine but uh say it has an engine but the handbrake is on right so it doesn't it doesn't go full performance uh, but but now now let's let's put the handbrake down and start looking at induction so induction says for any property whatsoever that we can form within predicate logic if zero has the property or if zero satisfies the predicate and if on top of that for all numbers if n satisfies the property then its successor also satisfies the property then it follows that every number satisfies the property and that's a very important proof method now i want to say mathematical induction has zero nothing to do with what is called induction in philosophy especially in epistemology okay nothing to do with it fun fact that term was introduced in i think 1801 or 1803 by um augustus de morgan the same guy after whom we named the de morgan laws so he is responsible for this bad terminology mathematical induction no mathematical induction is not induction in fact it is a very good deductive rule it is valid which means it has no possible counterexample which means that if the premises are true then it is guaranteed absolutely that the conclusion is true as well and i think it's 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 nice to see it as a fitch style rule right where we see there is a first premise saying zero has the property and then there's a second premise that says whenever n has the property the successor of n has as well and then the conclusion is that universal that says every number has the property phi okay now there is some terminology associated with the usage of that rule of inference the first premise which applies to uh, which is the property applies to zero that's called the base case we get we get started from there uh, furthermore the second premise is called the inductive step why is it called a step because well you step from n to its successor huh? and basically you're saying for any number you can step from it to its successor that's why it's called an inductive step and the conclusion well it's just the conclusion now the antecedent of the inductive step is usually pretty much universally called the inductive hypothesis and I strongly encourage that you use that terminology in your proof. So uh, you're going to first try to prove the base case. Then you're going to try to prove the inductive step. As part of the inductive step, you're going to pick an arbitrary object. And you're going to uh, make a supposition, right? Uh, in this case, let's say make a hypothesis, the inductive hypothesis and try to derive the consequent from there, okay? Uh, and then when we have proved those two premises, then the last line will follow automatically by the rule of induction. So we're gonna look at a lot of examples of that. 
uh, in what's coming. But first, I think we should just prove that induction is indeed a valid rule because uh, I think many of you will already know how to prove things by induction. You're like, what are you trying to teach me here? I know that stuff already. Uh, you might you might know, yeah. Uh, um, how you might be very good at making proof by induction, but why is this rule valid? Do you know the answer to that question? Why is this rule valid? Why is it that say we can prove by induction things about the natural numbers, but not about the real numbers? Why is that? I think if you haven't stopped to think about those questions, um, you 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 might still be good at at writing those proofs, but but your understanding of the theorem um, that you're proving is going to be much more shallow than, than you might imagine. So, so what we're going to do now is look at why. Why is it the case? Okay. So, so I presented uh, the proof that mathematical induction is valid. Uh, I present it as a Fitch diagram just to make sure you can keep track of, of where things are. Um, so, so the first thing we're going to do uh, is we're going to introduce a definition, okay? And I just want to introduce that definition because uh, we're going to use that, so to speak, as a premise. And we don't need to derive it from anything because it's justified. We know that set exists based on the axiom of separation. So we're going to form a set of natural numbers, namely the set that satisfies uh, the property phi. Now, we don't know at this point which does. We don't even know what's the property phi. But what we want to show is that, well, for any predicate phi, I can generate the set S. That's easy. That's guaranteed by the axiom of separation. Uh, and as we see, uh, since S is a set of natural numbers, then it follows directly. We saw that when we looked at the membership condition of the axiom of separation. S is a subset of omega. So S is a set of natural numbers. And then in addition, we're going to assume the two premises for the rule of induction. And we're going to try to derive the conclusion from uh, that definition and that fact that follows, um, uh, as well as our two premises. So we assume the base case. We assume the inductive step. And we show that on line 15, the conclusion follows as a result. Okay, so from line number three, oh, by the way, I should explain what the strategy is. So we're going to show that um, if three and four are satisfied, it follows that S is a successor set. That's what we're trying to show. And remember, there are two conditions to satisfy for S to be a successor set. So we're going to work on those separately. That's going to tell us S is a successor set. Now, since S is a subset of omega, and furthermore, omega is the smallest successor set, it's going to follow that omega is a, sub a subset of S as well, so they are equal, right? Now, if S and omega are equal, and S is defined as the set of objects satisfying phi, that means all natural numbers satisfy phi. That's the idea behind that proof. So let's get started. On line five, uh, we just apply the membership condition of the set S as it's defined on line one, and we use our premise on line three, and that tells us that zero satisfies the predicate phi, so zero is in S. Um, so half of the work is done to show that S is a successor set. Um, so that's what we're trying to show, as I said, on line 13. Uh, the second thing we need to show on top of line five is that for all elements, uh, oh, that's a bit of a redundant notation. Uh, for all n, if n is in S, then the successor of n is in S. So here I'm taking an arbitrary object m, and I assume that it's in S, the antecedent, uh, and I try to get the consequent out of that. So. M is in S. Since S is a subset of omega, it follows that M is in omega. Now, since M is an element of omega, that means we can use our uh, inductive step, which is assume on line four, and instantiate with the letter M. So that gives us phi M implies phi of the successor of M. 
Um, now, is it the case that M satisfies the property phi? Yes, because it's in S, right? So by the membership condition, it has to satisfy the property phi. So on line nine, M has the property phi, modus ponens gives us that. Now, since we have that, and we know that SM is a natural number, uh, that means that SM satisfies the membership condition for the set S, which gives us line 11. Now, since M is an arbitrary object by conditional proof plus universal introduction, we get line 12. And 5 and 12 together tells us uh, 13, S is a successor set. And moreover, as we saw, since omega, right, so think of that, S is in the collection of successor sets. Omega is the intersection of the connection. So it follows that um, Omega is a subset of S. Cool. So that means that every element of Omega are also in S, which means that they all satisfy the membership conditions of S. So for all N in Omega, for all natural numbers, they have the property phi. So that reasoning is why induction works. That's the proof that induction is a valid rule of inference. It's a fairly simple argument, right? You're like, all right, define a set. Uh, and then the two premises jointly can be understood as saying that set, the set of objects with the property phi is a successor set. Um, and that means uh, in addition that since omega is the smallest successor set, every natural number has the property. So, so now, now after looking at that proof, we see, we understand why induction is a valid proof of inference. And in fact, we can say the following, we can say, um, well, if we wanted to push a little bit deeper, um, well, first of all, we'd say that proof works because, particularly because Omega is the smallest successor set. That's the quintessential result of it. Um, but furthermore, if we were to define other successor sets where the first condition, let me go back a little, where the first condition doesn't say, uh, sorry, successor set. So if we were to define other successor sets where the base elements isn't zero, let's pick something else, right? Uh, but uh, we could pick another object and define a different kind of successor set that, that starts with something else. Uh, if we generated that other kind of successor sets, we would be able to reproduce all the reasoning that we have just done now uh, in order to get the uh, rule of induction to work on that set as well, okay? It would be a slightly different rule where the premise would not be phi zero, but phi whatever the other base element is, but we could just reproduce the whole same reasoning, okay? So mathematical induction is a property of minimal successor sets in general. And if the first premise is phi zero, then in particular, uh, that's the property of those natural numbers. It's a cool fact to know, I think. It's, it's very deep. Uh, not very hard to understand, I think, but very deep. So uh, uh, philosophers of mathematics have been impressed by that for so long, you know, <laughs> generation after generation. So induction works. So should we turn to the fifth? Our postulate of Dedekind piano. Mm -hmm. We should, but but the fifth one is harder to prove, even harder than this fourth one. So so we need to do. Well, it's not harder in the sense that the proof is more difficult, but there are just there's a little bit more work to do, uh, and some we're going to have to prove some propositions and prove them by induction, and then use those as premises to prove the fifth principle. Um, now, I just want to show you how to use induction so that when we turn to the proofs of those other uh, propositions we'll need, uh, um, you're going to see how the induction works. So 
<clears throat> so the CRM I want to show just to illustrate how induction works is, is a very simple one. Uh, for any natural number, if some things, if some set is belongs to a natural number, then that set itself is a natural number. So in, in plain English is uh, an element of a natural number is itself a natural number. Right? Of course, if we think of our intuitive picture that I gave you at the beginning, where we think of natural numbers as the set of natural numbers that come before them in the sequence, then yeah, of course, if it's an element of a natural number, it has to be itself a natural number that comes earlier in the sequence. Right? So that makes sense intuitively. But how do we prove that? Right? So, so that is the property written symbolically. And here there's a part in green. Okay. Um, and what I want to draw your attention to is, is the following. So look, let's look at our induction rule again. Right? So here I just wrote phi of zero, phi of n, and things like that. But phi itself um, doesn't have to be a simple property like is prime or is even or things like that. It can be a big formula itself as long as it contains a variable uh, that is, uh, uh, so as long as it contains the variable n, which is attached to that quantifier, if we do drop the quantifier, then we end up with a predicate in which n is a free uh, variable, a variable not associated with any truth value. Right? So here, if you just focus on the part in green, ignore that quantifier for a second. And, and say I would ask you, uh, is the part in green true or false? You're going to be looking at me and like, I don't know. You didn't tell me what n is, right? That's because n is a variable. It's a free variable. And as we see, uh, uh, as we saw before, expressions that contain exactly one free variable are properties, right? Uh, well, predicates expressing properties. So they can really be thought of as a complex entity that applies or fails to apply to objects, right? So if you put some object n in there, that's going to apply. <coughs> if you put other objects in there, maybe it's not going to. We don't know, right? So, so that part in green is going to act as the property phi. Okay, so that means that it might lead you to rather big expressions. So the base case is going to be the one that is on top here, in which I put the zero in blue. As you see, the base case is that green expression in which I remove the S and I throw in zero in there instead. Okay, so that's the base case. That's phi zero. And here I have for all n, if phi n, then phi of the successor of n. So for the antecedent, I haven't replaced anything. That's just phi n. For the consequent, I did replace something. Uh, I see there's a missing parenthesis here, sorry. Uh, I did replace n by sn. So that tells me phi n implies phi of the successor of n. Right, so um, when we're going to do proofs by induction, uh, by induction, the property phi is not in general going to be a simple formula. It's going to be a rather bigger formula, but you shouldn't be intimidated by that. That's part of the reason why we did a lot of logic at first to get comfortable and familiar with that formalism, so that now we can really look at an expression like like our sub goal here and not be intimidated by it. Well, at least not too much. And if you use fit diagrams, it's, it's quite easy really to find your way uh, through those sorts of mazes that can occur here. So now we fixed two sub goals because we want to prove the conclusion by induction. The first goal is the base case. The second is the inductive step or the induction step. Now we're going to try to prove them separately. And then from that, we're going to get the conclusion by induction. So let's look at our first 
premise, the base case. Um, for all s, if s is in zero, then s is a natural number. Now, we have a typical case that we've examined already, and I really hope that it's starting to sink in. We've defined zero to be the empty set. Do you think there is anything in the empty set? No, of course. So that means that for any object we would pick, the antecedent would turn out false, right? So let me put the first premise. Nothing is in the empty set, so that means two is vacuously true. If you try to do it with a Fitch diagram, that would be man, max five lines, uh, but, but that would not be very hard to do here. I'm just, since we looked at those cases of a, vacuous truth and assuming that it's uh on board um you know if i if i didn't skip steps here that wouldn't fit on the slide so so i have to uh to keep just the right amount of, of details so so we have proved our first premise the, the base case just by pointing out that it follows by the definition of zero as the empty set it follows that that it's vacuously true so now we turn to our second sub goal, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to pick an arbitrary natural number and we're going to assume that this arbitrary natural number uh, satisfies the antecedent. Now, if you allow me to my Fitch diagrams, um, in order to, again, to make them fit on one slide, I will assume on the same line that M is an arbitrary natural number and that M satisfies the inductive hypothesis. And, and it's really close to how mathematicians write those proofs anyway, but for me, I'm, I'm running out of space, so that, that's really my motivation for, for uh, putting both suppositions on the same line. So the comma, you could think of it as a conjunction if you want, okay? So that's just a list of two things that I'm assuming at the same time. Of course, you could do it as part of two subgroups, but then that would take two more lines and that would be too cramped for me. And the supposition we'd be doing here is a uh, supposition for a conditional proof. That, that's this part here, uh, which is uh, for the um, restricted quantifier. And the second part is the inductive hypothesis per se. Um, okay. And then we have our sub goal, which is again, it looks like the first, the same formula at first, but really this is phi of m and this is phi of sm, the successor of m. So now we try to reach that sub goal here. So what are we going to do? It's going to be a universal introduction, and before that, a conditional proof. So as we're now getting used to, I'm going to condense both into it. So I'm going to take an arbitrary element T. I'm going to suppose that it's in the successor of M. That's my antecedent. And then I'm going to show that as a result, it's in the, con it, the consequent is true. So T is in omega. Right? So if T is a member of the successor of M, it follows that T is uh, a natural number. Right, so I've assumed M is a natural number. I've assumed that every elements of M are natural numbers. And now I'm trying to show that if we assume those two things, then it follows that an element of the successor of M is also going to be a natural number. So the property will apply to the successor, the successor as well. Now, if T is in the successor of M, now the successor of M is M union singleton M, right? So it tells us two things. T is in M or T equals M. That's just the membership condition for pairs. And very importantly, and I need to stress that right now because that's going to be a recurrent theme in our proofs by induction. The successor of M is a union of two things. So the membership condition for unions apply. So the successor of M is M union singleton M. So if T is in the successor, if T is in the union, it means either it's on the left-hand side, so either it's in M 
or it's in the right hand side which is singleton m which means that t equals m so so that's so seeing that five follows from four is is crucial you should you should start to think about that otherwise the rest of what i'm gonna say uh in this lecture in the next is gonna be like <coughs> it's gonna hurt right so so stop and think about that. Four, five does follow from four, given how the successor is defined. And then we're going to do a disjunction elimination. So suppose that T is an M, right? Suppose T is an M. Well, then our inductive hypothesis kicks in, where I instantiate the conditional with T, which gives me T is an M, implies that T is in omega. Uh, so, so... To go from line six to seven, I've used my inductive hypothesis. I've instantiated it with T and I did a mode exponents all in one to go from six to seven. So I hope that's clear enough. Again, space is running out, so I have to condense. Second case, T equals M, okay? So now here's what I can do, right? Uh, I can use line three, but this time the other assumption. So if T equals M, since M is in omega, it follows that T is in S. What am I doing here? Folks, I'm so sorry. It should be on line seven, T is in omega, and on line it should be T in omega as well. Oh my God. Sorry about that. So correction both cases end with t as in omega and of course with that correction made uh, it gives us line number 10 by disjunction elimination okay um, and then from that entire subproof growing from 4 to 10 uh, we get uh, we get the the consequent of our inductive step from line three and 11, we do a conditional proof, or if you don't make the two assumption on the same line, you do two conditional proofs in a row, uh, and then uh, a universal introduction, and that gives you line 12, which is the inductive step. So now we have the base case on line two, we have the, base, the inductive step on line 12, and that gives us line 13, which is uh, obtained by induction, right? So, so now we know that any element of a natural number is itself a natural number. Now at this point, I'd like to, um, to do a little bit of a digression, which is something I've never really seen in a math textbook um, or a philosophy book that tries to explain how to make proof. Uh, and it's to answer the question, when do we need to use induction? So why should you think, all right, for that proof, I'm going to use induction rather than some other proof strategy? Uh, and, and I'd like to give you a rule of thumb, uh, which, which I think works pretty well. Um, um, and it's important to have a rule of thumb like that because sometimes you're going to try by induction and suppose you fail for a while, you're like, oh, maybe I should use another proof method, right? Maybe, maybe I shouldn't be using induction after all. You know, it's um, uh, proving theorems is sort of an ecstatic uh, experience when you actually get it, but, but when you don't get it, it's, it's excruciating, right? It's painful. Um, um, so you might be trying for a long time by induction and, and failing, and, and then you'd start thinking, well, maybe I should have, maybe I should use another method. Maybe induction is not the right one, or maybe you use another method and you're, you're failing. Or, or maybe I should use induction, but but then maybe it's not going to work, right? So, so this one giving you a rule of thumb to try to put some structure into that. So, so my rule of thumb is this: if the theorem essentially refers to natural numbers then you should use induction but by essential reference to natural numbers i i don't mean that the letter omega shows up in there or something like that it's more than just uh, the letter shows up right? what i mean is that the theorem is true of natural numbers but if if you replaced uh, uh the elements of omega if you replace the, the reference to natural numbers by reference to arbitrary sets, 
uh, if if it wouldn't be true in that case, then that means that the structure of natural numbers plays an essential role in making that theorem true. true. And, and typically that means induction is going to be the, the proof. So here's what I mean. Let me give an example of what I mean by essential reference to natural numbers. And we're going to come back to that theorem here, right? So, um, so we have that conclusion for any natural numbers and for any set whatsoever. If that set is in M, then that set is in omega. Right? So any element of a natural number is an element of omega. Now, would it work to say that if S is a member of something, um, then it's in omega, right? So, so if we rewrote that theorem as being about all sets, not about specifically natural numbers, would that still work? Right, so let's look at it. Well, Beethoven, da -da 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 -da. Uh, Beethoven is in singleton Beethoven, uh, but Beethoven is not a natural number, a natural number. Um, in, in French, we say that uh, someone is quite a numero when they are uh, quite a character, so to speak. And numero is a, a variant on, on number. Uh, so we can't say Beethoven was quite a numero, but it doesn't follow that he's a number. <laughs> so he's not an omega. Right? Uh, so here we have an example of uh, um, S, where, where here S, I, I didn't take a set, I took an object. You could do it by taking a small variation. So S is in X, uh, but S is, of course, not in omega. Right? So, so it's not true of all sets. The reference to the natural numbers is, is crucial. And that tells you that to show the theorem uh, on the last slide, we have to use induction. If we were trying to show it without induction, it wouldn't work. Unless, you know, it's a super convoluted proof. That in effect does the same as induction. Okay, so so that tells us that when 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 this theorem comes up false, it says that to be part of a minimal successor set is essential for that to be true. And that's when you should use induction. So, so in, in the uh, notes, I'll give you a little exercise. Uh, so, so I ask you to find two sets X and Y such that X is in Y, but the successor of X is not in the successor of Y, okay? So, so if you find that, that's going to make you think, oh, it's not the case that for all X and for all Y, if X is in Y, then the successor of X is in the successor of Y. However, uh, though, whoops, though it is not true for, uh, for sets in general, that particular sentence happens to be true about uh, natural numbers. And you can prove that by induction. For any M and N, that are in omega. So for any two natural numbers, if M is in M, then SM, the successor of M, is in SN, the successor of M. So you're going to try to prove that by induction. That's one of your exercises. Um, <clears throat> now, since the first quantifier quantifies over M, right, for all M in omega, that means that for that proof by induction, you're going to take the property to be everything that follows that main quantifier. Namely, for all n in omega, if m is in n, then sm is in sn. Notice that in this formula here, m is a free variable. Right? If I ask you, is that formula true or false? You have to tell me, I don't know. What is m? I don't know. Right? So that means it's a good predicate that we can use in order to set up our proof by induction. And at first, I definitely encourage you to use sketch diagrams to do those. They're going to be much simpler. Okay? So that's, that's it for my rule of thumb that helps you to uh, determine if something is proved by induction or not. Uh, now, of course, there's another rule of thumb, which is if it's in this, this chapter, it's probably proved by induction because it's a chapter about learning how to prove things by induction, duh. But uh, you're gonna have a, an intellectual life after this course. Uh, so, uh, so then you might have to make those tougher decisions about, hey, what strategy am I gonna use in order to prove that? 
So finally, let's come back to our fifth principle of uh, the, the Dedekind piano arithmetic. Uh, but before we prove it, we need to prove two more things by induction. <laughs> two more. Right? So we're going to prove the first one. Um, and the second is going to be uh, left as an exercise. Uh, it's similar to a large extent. So let's look at the second. Any element of a natural number is a subset of that natural number. So it says for any natural number and any x, if x is an element of the natural number, then x is a subset of that natural number. Okay, so uh, I, I give you the symbolic expression for it so that um, it's easier to set up your induction. Of course, the part that begins with for all x is going to play the role of the property phi n uh, that you're going to use in order to do your induction. Uh, but that's left as an exercise. We're going to look at the first one. Um, so it's going to be trickier than the first proof that we looked at, but, but not massively so. Uh, it still fits on one slide. <laughs> Um, so, so it says no natural number is a subset of one of its elements, or to put it differently, for all n, if n is a natural number, uh, or say for all natural numbers, if n for all x, if x is an n, then n is not a subset of x. So let's look at that. That's the symbolic expression for that first theorem, for all n any natural number and for all x if x is an element of the natural number then the natural number is not a subset of x you might be thinking that's a little bit weird all this talk about being a member of a natural number and being a subset of a natural number and i agree there's a little bit of awkwardness here uh but it does make sense, though, if you think of a natural number as being identified with the natural numbers that come before it, right? Uh, that was our intuitive idea that we started with. Um, so, so this is why we need to prove those those few little theorems here to help us thinking about those those items. So we're going to prove it by induction. Again, I put in green the property phi n. And then we're going to set up our base case and our inductive step. So for the base, for, for the uh, base case, we have that sentence. And here again, the antecedent is the part in green unchanged. And the consequent is the part in green where I have replaced n by Sn, the successor of n. So again, here we, we're in luck. Uh, we're in luck because the antecedent uh, is also vacuously true, just like in our previous question, which means that most of the work is going to be about proving the inductive step. So uh, again, I'm going to combine both of my, I should have written supposition for conditional proof and IH, to say that there are two assumptions, but anyway. Um, uh, we take an arbitrary element of uh, omega, call it M, and we assume uh, uh, that the property applies to it. That's our inductive hypothesis. And then we try to reach our sub-goal. So our sub-goal is going to require that we also pick an arbitrary object, make a supposition about it. Um, and then we're going to reach our sub-goal by conditional proof plus uh, universal introduction. So this is why we set up another conditional proof where I pick an arbitrary object A, uh, and I assume that it's in the successor of M, my antecedent, and then I try to show that as a result, it's not a subset of A. And yeah, we're gonna make that, that proof. The, the first part to, the first thing to notice is the thing that I've pointed out before, I told you it's very typical, and it is very typical. So here we have an element of the successor set of M. The successor set of M is a union. So the membership condition for unions is going to kick in. It tells us either A is in M or A equals M. It has to be one of those two. 
So that gives us two cases. And I'm going to look at the first case first, A is an M. And again, remember, I should have put it here because that, that's my sub goal, right? I want it to be on the last line for that case. So this is what I'm going to try to do. Now, if I want to show that the successor of M is not a subset of A, I need to show that there's something in M which isn't in A. Now, that, that, that's basically what we need to do, right? So, so that means we need to find that object here. Hmm. What are we going to do? Well, A is in M. That seems like we could connect that with our inductive hypothesis. Instantiate the X with A, do a mode exponents, and it tells you M is not a subset of A. So now we know M is not a subset of A, and we'd like to show from that that the successor of M is not a subset of A either, okay? So that's how it works. So from six, we know that there exists an object which is in M, but not in A. So I make a supposition for an existential elimination. I didn't write the existential explicitly, but it would be like line 6.5. So take an arbitrary object, B, uh, and suppose that it's in M, but that is not in A. Now, if B is in M, we discussed that very early on, right after we introduced the definition of the successor of a set. If B is in M, it follows that B is also in the successor of M. That was one of the first things we said about the successors, uh, the successor operation. So that means that we have an element which is in the successor of M, but not in A. So by, uh, uh, well, okay, I would have to do an existential generalization and then an existential elimination. So there's also a little line missing here, uh, but you get the idea that I get as a conclusion that uh, the successor of M is not a subset of A. Again, I'm running out of space, so I had to condense things a little bit. Now I'm going to look at my second case. Remember, case one is A is in M. Second case is A is in singleton M, which is A equals M. So that's going to be my second case. A equals M. And I again try to show that the successor of M is not a subset of A. So now we need to... In my view, that, that step is, is the hard part here. Uh, the natural thing to do, the, the first idea I think that, that would come to a lot of people is, including me, by the way, uh, is to be like A, e, A equals M, so M is a subset of A. Modus tollens with that, which gives me A is in M, and then I would be stuck. I would, well, I would probably work for like five or 10 minutes and be like, what am I missing? What am I missing? What am I missing? I don't get it. That's also quite typical of proofs by induction. Often for the cases of identity, the idea is to take our inductive step and apply substitution of identicals to it. Right, so here I take my inductive step, I replace M by A. Look at that, I replace M by A. And then I instantiate it with, well, okay, so then I get M is a, a is a subset of M, not M is a subset of A, I just flip things around. Um, and then I instantiate line 11, and this time not with A, but with M. And then I do my modus tollens with M to get M is not in A. And that's clever, and that's cool, because I'm looking for an object which is in the successor of M, but not in A. Now I have it. It's M itself, because M is in the successor of M. We saw that very early on. M is not in A, so boom, bingo. The successor of M is not a subset of A. Then I do a little bit of conditional proof, a little bit of universal elimination, uh, sorry, uh, disjunction elimination, then CPs, then universal introduction. I do a bunch of those, bum, 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 lines 15, oh, sorry, 
16, 17, 18. And then finally, we get line 19 by induction from line 2 and line 18. That proof um, is easy to follow when it's presented to you in a fish diagram, but it's not so easy to do it yourself. Uh, but, but the two theorems, um, if I can return to the last slide, those two theorems um, are important, okay? Uh, so one is left as an exercise. It shouldn't be too hard to prove, but they are very important because for many other results that we will study later on uh, in this lecture and the next, those two theorems will be used to connect things together. So please take a little bit of time to, to think about them. Um, I want to draw two immediate consequences of them to begin with. For the first theorem, um, that that no natural number of sorry let, let's come back to it the, the first theorem is the one we just looked at here right? so so if n is a member of n it follows that n is not a subset of n but every set is a subset of itself because subset is reflexive right so it follows that no natural number is a member of itself which fits with our intuitive idea, according to which a natural number is identified with the set of its predecessors of the numbers less than it, okay? So that's cool. That's a direct consequence of that theorem that we just proved. Uh, the other theorem, which I symbolized as follows, I want to draw uh, to your attention the fact that those two formulas are logically equivalent because of the way we define the subset, okay? But this one, this one, if you just look at the part after the quantifiers, it says y is in x, x is in n, implies y is in n. That looks like the definition of transitivity that we had before. Now, we saw that in general, if we take any three sets, it's not the case that if A is in B and B is in C, then A is in C. You had an, a homework assignment question in which you showed that this wasn't true by giving me a, a counterexample. Now, though that's not true of sets in general, the beauty is that it is true if uh, the, the rightmost object is a natural number because Okay, everything that it's in a natural number, x, is itself a natural number, so that means y is also a natural number. So the quantifiers don't say it, but the first theorem that we proved by induction implies that y, x, and n are all natural numbers here, okay? So, so, so that says that though membership is not a transitive relation, if we restrict our attention to natural numbers, it is a transitive relation. And we express, that, we express that fact by saying that omega, the set of natural numbers, is a transitive set. Okay, so for any three natural numbers, if one is a member of the second and the second is a member of the third, it follows that the first is a member of the third. Very important fact that will come up in many proofs. Okay. So this is why uh, we prove those two things right now. They're a little bit of a pain in the ass, but they're very powerful and they're going to come back over and over and over again. And then at, this, at that point, just feel free to refer to what was proved before. Don't reprove it every time. It's, it's insane, right? Just refer to it. In the notes, they have a, a number to make it easy for you to refer to, to them. Okay, so now we've done a few proofs by induction, uh, many more exercises in the notes, many more coming. Uh, I just want to point out that for many of the proofs we've used before, like conditional proof, proof by reductio, and things like that, they can be embedded into each other, right? We can do a conditional proof within a conditional proof within a proof by reductio. No problem, we've done so many of those now. 
at the beginning of the semester remember that was scary stuff uh um, you may not remember but I definitely remember the faces I would see uh, and that was that was fear you know, that's what I was seeing and now now you got a lot more comfortable now that doesn't mean there's not a little bit of intimidation left but but I think it's going to at least now you're comfortable with embedding three conditional proofs within each other easy right um, so now we keep adding things uh, it's going to be the case for induction as well, that sometimes you're going to have an induction within an induction. Right? So to do a proof by induction, you need to prove the base case and you need to prove the, the inductive step. Sometimes proving the base case and the inductive step is itself going to require a proof by induction. Um, so so those, those get harder. Um, in, the, in a sense, they get harder. But if you follow our methodology of fidget diagram, you will see that it's still a fairly mechanical procedure to break down a problem into sub, sub problems, into sub goals and things like that. So that's why I think that methodology is so, so amazing. Uh, and that especially people interested with formal methods should really take a course like this one in their first year. That's where it's going to be the most useful to them. Uh, and I'm convinced that it's boosting averages in other courses as well, though I don't have data. It's confidential information. All right. <clears throat> so here's an example that I give you uh, in the notes. Uh, did I mention that one before? Yeah. And if M is a member of N, then this, um, um, uh, the successor of M is in the successor of M, right? So I told you earlier on how you would prove that by induction. Guess what? To prove that one by induction, you're going to need to do an induction within an induction, okay? So uh, both the base case and the inductive step will themselves be proved by induction. So those are tricky, tricky proofs. Uh, but again, Fitch diagram, you might need a big piece of paper, but uh, it still allows you to organize your thoughts. Okay, uh, after a long detour, uh, we're now ready to talk about our fifth principle of uh, Dedekind piano arithmetic. The first says, uh, if the successor of M, sorry, it says, if the successor of M equals the successor of N, then M equals N, as, as we mentioned. Um, that just means that S is an injective function. So after all those slides, we're finally ready to prove that the successor function is injective. And the proof is fairly simple. So we're going to assume the antecedent, the successor of M is the successor of M. Now we know that M is in the successor of M, which by extensionality means that it's also in the successor of M and vice versa, right? So then we get M is in the, uh, okay, yeah, M is in the successor of M, N is in the successor of N, from which it follows that M is in the successor of N and vice versa, N is in the successor of N. Now, as I mentioned before, those two things are really disjunctions in disguise because the successor sets are union, so the membership condition of unions is a disjunction. So that gives us either M is in N or M equals N. And furthermore, uh, N is in M or N equals N. Now, if you break that down, it gives you four possible cases where you have the first here and the first here, or the first here and the second there, or the second here and the first here, or the first here, the second here and the second there. Now, of those four cases, four of them are going to contain the formula M equals N, which gives us just what we want. So that's easy, right? So we're gonna focus on the fourth case that does not contain M equals N. That's the tricky one to prove. And that's going to require the, the theorems that we've proved before. So let's focus on the case M is in N, N furthermore, N is in M. And now I think you see that and you're like, oh my God, M is in N, N is in M. 
if only membership was a transitive relation that would tell me that M is a member of M, but the natural numbers are a transitive set. That's what our theorem number one says. So it follows that M is an M from the first theorem, okay? By the other theorem, or, or the consequence that I listed on, on last slide, uh, we said no natural number is a member of itself. That was based on observing that every natural number is a subset of itself, right? So, so by those two, so based on that fourth case, by applying the two theorems, we've seen that no natural number is a member of itself. That, okay, that's the consequence, but by applying that result, plus the fact that the natural numbers are a transitive set, we very easily got our result uh, that this fourth case leads to a contradiction, okay? So that means that fourth case is impossible. So one of the first three cases must be the case, this Dunker syllogism. But each of those cases include the claim that M equals M. So that gives us our conclusion, bingo. That was a lot of work, but I've tried to decompose it and organize it in a way that is making sense by focusing on really the important points. And I hope you find that convincing. Uh, before saying goodbye, uh, I want to add one more thing, which is that based on everything we've said, we can also define an order relation, the less than relation on the natural number. I said at the beginning, oh, we're assuming that we know what's an order, uh, what's the less than relation on natural number and foundations of arithmetic should have something to say about that. We shouldn't just assume it. And that would be correct. So now we can define it easily. If M is a member of N, that means M and N is identified with the numbers that come before, that should mean that M is less than N. And in fact, that's exactly what our definition says. So from the set theory point of view, M is a member of N, where M and N are numbers, natural numbers, and M is less than N. Those are two ways of saying the same thing by definition. Now, based on that definition, we can show that this order relation is what mathematicians called a strict total order. So, so that means that uh, that relation is irreflexive. Of course, it's irreflexive because we have a theorem that tells us that no natural number is a member of itself. So that's irreflexive. Uh, that's also transitive. We have a theorem that tells us that omega is a transitive set, so boom. Um, it's asymmetric. That's very similar to the argument that we proved in uh, uh, the principle, the proof of principle five, right? So it says if n is a member of, if n is a member of m, then m is not a member of m. Uh, that's fairly easy. Trichotomy says that for any two number, either M is a subset of N or N is a, sorry, not subset. Either M is less than N or N is less than M or M equals N, right? So any two numbers relate to each other in this way. And that's a little bit trickier, but maybe I'm overselling it. Maybe it's not that tricky. Definitely it's a proof by induction, okay? But if you use the two principles that we have discussed already, um, then I think you're going to find out that it's not so difficult to prove. But I'm, I'm advertising it as tricky so that you don't feel too discouraged if you are struggling trying to prove it. Well, I haven't decided whether I'm going to ask that question in the exam, but it might be that I do. Uh, but again, use those two key theorems that we have proved and that we've used already, like a number is not a part of a member, no number is a member of itself and also omega is a transitive set. And, and those two results are going to help you uh, in a big way, okay? So I'm running out of energy now, so uh, I'm gonna stop. Uh, thank you for uh, taking the time to watch this. I hope you found it interesting. Uh, 
there's a lot of stuff that I'm sure many of you knew already, but I, I hope it was uh, philosophically pleasing to examine it uh, with some more depth, uh, some more systematicity. Um, I think there's a great elegance that comes out of that systematicity, and I hope you have felt it a little bit and that you will enjoy uh, working on the exercises. Okay, so thank you very much and see you in the next video.